we'll be starting the glaucoma session what's new in glaucoma in 2020 and it covers a wide variety of topics in glaucoma and myself i'm dr tanush dada and with me uh, uh, chairing the session is dr steve mansberger <coughs> from usa so without much delay we'll start the session the first topic is new glaucoma drugs and delivery systems and this talk is be given by Dr. S. S. Panda, whom you all know he's an international figure in glaucoma and head of the glaucoma department at PGI Chandigarh. So we welcome Dr. Panda and look forward to hearing from him. Uh, before I start, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Tanus, particularly for inviting me to, including me to this program. A uh, lot of new things have been happening in glaucoma. I think once again, it's a very exciting field. Uh, I'll just take you through what's happening in the uh, drug uh, system. So treatment of glaucoma, basically, it involves reduction in IOP, essentially. And in a, if he's stated simply, you need 20, 30 percent reduction in most of these patients from the baseline. And of course, we have neuroprotection and regeneration in the back of mind and in the wish list, uh, which is always there. So there are a number of drugs to lower IOP, and uh, typically we have just five classes of drugs which are available to us for, a, for some time now. Uh, but we all know the problems with the drugs. Uh, they have the side effects, toxicity, uh, compliance is an issue, and also availability costs. And there are many, uh, plus the dosing schedule uh, is difficult sometimes. So we are always looking for some alternative therapies uh, where we can make it simpler for the, pa for the patients. Uh, a number of new targets have been identified for uh, glaucoma drugs, and I think the most uh, uh, promising one has been the row associated protein kinase, or the ROC. Uh, these are the GTP binding proteins, uh, row A, B, and C, and they have kind of two isoforms, ROC1 and ROC2. Uh, these proteins are expressed in the glucometers optic uh, nerve heads, and they're also there in the, uh, uh, the typical meshwork, ciliary muscle, and they are known to regulate the contrail properties of the typical meshwork and also synthesis of uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, so, and also they have other effects, some CNS effect where you could be helping the neural survival and increasing the optic nerve flow. So the, the molecules, they seem to be uh, promising. And uh, the new drugs which have come out of these uh, targeting these uh, uh, pathways is the, the ripacidal hydrochloride uh, that we have now. Uh, in the Japan, it is available as Glentech. And in India, it has just been launched as Ripatech. So we don't have uh, post-marketing or uh, the clinical data in India yet. But in the coming months and years, we'll uh, get to know how this drug, uh, drug works in our population. But the phase three clinical uh, trials have shown good response with it. Uh, Netacidil is uh, the one actually he came before. And this is, again, a rock inhibitor. This is marketed in the US like a Ropressa. Is increases aqueous outflow through trapezoidal meshwork and stem canal, and also reduces aqueous production, and it's uh, about 22 percent, 20, 25 percent in that range. Aqueous uh, IOP lowering can be achieved with this drug. Now, both of these drugs are in the clinical uh, available clinically to physicians now, and. Uh, 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 we don't have any experience in India, but I think we are going to build up very soon. Uh, conjunctal hyperpremia remains the main uh, issue with these medicines, and but it's said that with the continued use, say about one month therapy, it tends to go away. Rocklatin uh, uh, rock is a fixed dose combination, which is already available uh, with the netrasudal and uh, latinoprost. Uh, other targets are the NOS nitric oxide synthase targets, NOS one, two, three. And uh, they are also accepted in the ciliary body as well as uh, uh, in the vascular endothelium and also the trapezoidal meshwork. Uh, the drug which is being developed uh, with the netos is uh, latinoprost, uh, latinoprostine bon bono, uh, LBN. And this is a nitrous oxide donating prostaglandin. And this is held already entered phase three clinical trial. And we kind of hope that this will be, uh, this also has some neuroprotection uh, in the and the other drug is the adenosine, which another uh, target is the adenosine uh, uh, receptors. Uh, they are present uh, in, in the eye and in the ciliary body. And also, um, uh, that kind of, if you find an agonist for these receptors, that will have a, uh, uh, the, the effect on the aqueous production. So it will decrease the aqueous production. So again, this drug is there in the clinical trials. And some uh, promising, like six, five, five millimeter IUP reduction has been noted uh, uh, with these drugs. Then you have other uh, molecules. There are a number of molecules actually which are in the pipeline, and we have the small interfering RNA, uh, which is again, it, it's a, 
uh, works through uh, genetic mechanisms and it more or less work, works like a beta blocker. And uh, in phase two clinical trials, it was found to be more or less uh, similar to uh, beta blocker timolol. Uh, there are many more things coming up, aptamir-based uh, therapies, uh, oligonucleotide-based compounds, antisense uh, oligonuclear uh, stem cells, and also neuroprotective uh, drugs. So I think some of this you'll probably hear in the, and the gene therapy, of course, that you'll hear subsequently. Then coming to the delivery system, the compliance, as I said, is a big issue. Uh, it's, uh, the, the therapy is sometimes very inconvenient. There are side effects, costs, and above all, there's a forgetfulness as well. So we all forget things. and. You know, sometimes we, some people forget more than others, but we all do it. Uh, and also the newer therapies uh, would need uh, appropriate delivery systems, so we have to have newer delivery system uh, in that regard as well. To get the sustained IOP lowering, which is very important for glaucoma therapy, the number of uh, devices have been tried and are uh, still being investigated. Contact lenses, inserts, injectables, and even surgical implants. So looking at the inserts, so the puncture plugs uh, they have in the found way into the clinical use. So they're very tiny uh, plug, which is uh, uh, impregnated a bit. Uh, uh, Traboprost, so these are basically uh, polymers which contain levoprost, and this uh, OTXTP uh, has been tested. It's like 23% IOP reduction with a good retention rate, about 90%. Sometimes they can be lost because they get just lost from the punctum and then be lost. So that uh, monitoring is required, and also we have it uh, implant, which is uh, uh, L-shaped implant, and that uh, contains Traboprost. Uh, inserts, uh, Ocuserts were with pilocarpine and timolol, but have been there actually for a long time, but they uh, went into disuse because of, you know, the, the retention was a problem. They would pop out and go out of the eye, and also there were local reactions, uh, hyperemia and, uh, you know, granuloma formation. Uh, more recently, we have bimetoprost, which has come, and uh, this is a ring uh, implant. This stays much better. It doesn't pop out easily. And this, is, uh, this contains uh, 13 milligrams of uh, bimetoprost, which is released gradually uh, over uh, six months, actually. So it could be retained uh, for up to uh, six months. And if you look at the clinical data that we have, it, it seems to work well. Uh, it reduces intercular pressure significantly from the baseline over a period of uh, six months. But uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, uh, if you compare it with the topical drops, so uh, the topical drops, uh, bimetal drops, they still do uh, better IOP control as compared to the sustained releasing. So pulse therapy uh, has a, some value there uh, over uh, this uh, sustained uh, delivery. And then we also have intracameral injections, uh, uh, could be bimetoprost as well as traboprost is available, and there are different formulations there. Uh, so this is an injectable bimetoprost. Uh, you can have this, a small injector there. And you can inject it through a very, you know, through a, this injectors in needle track. And uh, this insertable uh, implant is injectable implant is left into the anterior chamber from where it keeps on releasing the drug, uh, you know, over a period of time. And up to six months, it can uh, deliver uh, drugs. And after that, you have to uh, give another one. Uh, this is uh, data from uh, this implant, and this has been kind of various doses. If you look at, they have been. Uh, given, but uh, all doses, they are, there is a kind of a dose response curve as well, but uh, by and large, it uh, gives you a good sustained IOP lowering. Uh, but again, if you compare it with the pulse therapy in the other eye, uh, that scores a little better uh, than the device. Then we have surgical implants, and there are many other things which are injected, could be injected uh, subconjunctively or could be implanted subconjunctively. Uh, some, some are based on micro uh, electromechanical systems where you can inject the drug so reservoir subconjunctively and it keep on releasing the drug and when it is finished like you know that how long it's going to work and then you can recharge it in the as an office procedure so uh, you can give another uh, which is this recharging is kind of minimally invasive so you could do it in the office setting so we also have eye drops in the gel form which are already there timolol gel is already there but we are also having now nanopart uh, uh, formulations which will penetrate better and also stay in the eye longer and also some liposomal preparations uh, in the pipeline. To summarize, uh, there are a number of new pathways uh, regulating aqueous hemodynamics have been identified. Uh, newer drugs uh, and many new drugs targeting these pathways are already uh, 
in the pipeline, some are just become, becoming clinically available. Uh, newer drugs would need new delivery system as well as the better delivery systems can make existing glaucoma drugs uh, you know, prescribed in a more convenient manner and help uh, manage glaucoma effectively and help save vision. Thank you so much. for questions um, I had a question you know I you see sustained delivery in um, OBGYN for preventing pregnancy you see uh, sustained delivery for diabetic um, blood sugar control if you had this available where would this fit into your armamentarium would you start with sustained delivery or would you start with eye drops and then go to sustained delivery how would this fit uh, I think probably we'll go the eye drops first we have to see that the, the particular molecule is working for that patient and uh, if the patient is, uh, is, you know, if it's kind of it doesn't fit into his lifestyle or it doesn't fit into the management protocol, then we'll have to think about the sustained uh, delivery systems. Again, sustained delivery system was also the ones which are insert type, which can be removed easily, so they can be prescribed with a little, you know, with a less caution. But the, the injectable ones, you really have to kind of uh, talk to the patient and consider uh, all the pros and cons before you give it, because this injection is kind of an injection. The eye is invasive. Yeah, make, the patients are scared when you say, as soon as you yeah. have to inject it in your eye, yes. they're a little bit scared. Yeah. Um, the second question I had um, is, most of these sustained delivery don't work as well as the eye drops. Yes. Um, do you know why that is, and do you think that um, the increased compliance will uh, make these valuable, considering that they might have less lowering, or yeah. how do you? Uh, I think uh, that that's a very good uh, question, and I, I think uh, researchers are puzzled over that. But it's probably because when you have pulse therapy, you have time in between when the drug is not there in the eye and the receptors, they kind of fade, they are there. But if there's a constant uh, overdosing, there's a constant exposure to the receptors, they probably they, they get downgraded. So you have less receptors actually to do the job. So I think that's why there's a little bit of uh, uh, you know, loss of efficacy when it comes to uh, constant uh, delivery systems. Uh, but, but again, whether, whether you want to use it or not, that depends on the IUP requirement. If your requirement is well within that, you know, with loss of efficacy, that's fine. But if you really need, the target IUP is really low, then probably you'll have to uh, think uh, about that. Yes, you have a question? Yes, please. Sir, you have shown that injectable uh, inserts. So how to, so it becomes an intraocular implant. So versus the subtenon, which is extraocular. So which is better and how to inject and because you have shown the gonioscopic picture. So uh, how we should target it? Uh, I, I think uh, this uh, field is still evolving actually and you certainly have a point because intraocular versus which is extraocular. So if you have something which is equally effective and easily administrable both the places, probably extraocular might be a better choice where people will be uh, more confident in using that and also the patient will be more confident in using it. But uh, we, we don't have any extraocular injectables uh, uh, as such. I think this, the, the data is limited. I think the field is still open so we'll see how it goes. Okay sir, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Shamira Pereira, who is Associate Professor from the Singapore National Eye Center, Duke NUS. And he'll be speaking on the role of micropulse laser in glaucoma. Is it worth it? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I've been given the title of Micropulse Laser, Is It Worth It? And I'll be going through some various case scenarios with you and working out where it stands in our armamentarium before finally giving you a cost-benefit analysis. These are my financial disclosures, none of which are relevant for this particular presentation. Now, as you can see by this following statistics, glaucoma surgery is stagnating. You can see the numbers of our trabecular plasties and iridotomies are quite stable, and our glaucoma procedures have also leveled out at a particular uh, plateau. The, there's also been a, a concurrent decline in transcleral cyclopid coagulation, as you can see by the downward trend. But also, uh, that's been balanced that's out, working. but more than balanced out, actually, by an increase in endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. And that's only up to 2012. So what happens after that? 
we have a, a series of current options for refractory glaucomas, ranging now from MPTCP, the micropulse TCP, traditional tube surgery, and cyclodestructive procedures like transpleural cyclophotocoagulation, which you've seen before. There's been a need for this treatment, this new micropulse treatment, because of some of the devastating side effects of the traditional uh, cyclophotocoagulation. You could have the pain, inflammation, high femur, conjunctival burns, progression of cataract, chronic hypotony, and the pressure spikes, and finally the, the loss of vision that you can get. Also quite devastating is the sympathetic ophthalmia you can get in the fellow eye as well. These have been well documented in the past and there's been a, a push to have something that is safer. Now, the European Glaucoma Society mission statement says the goal of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient's visual function and quality of life. But what people also forget is that it does say at the end, at a sustainable cost. And with the increase in healthcare costs proceeding at an exponential level at the moment, there's a definite need to put a rein on this. The Micropulse TCP works similar to our traditional diode laser, but what it does, it cuts up the pulses into small bursts, and hence it avoids the thermal increase that you get, which is normally associated with the, the diode laser, the continuous wave diode laser. Here's some examples uh, in, a, in an illustration and in real life Apple Miyagi views of the continuous wave on the left, and you can see the contraction burns that occur at the ciliary processes. This is due to a thermal effect. And you can see also the contraction at the ciliary body here when a pulse is applied. In contrast, when you look at the micropulse technology on the right, you can see that the, the laser spot moves over but doesn't cause any obvious um, reduction in the, um, uh, the, the scleral fibers. And, and it's a very, very subtle movement, if anything, of the ciliary body. We know that t standard TCP is very destructive. If I can take your attention to some of the pictures here, you can see here that there's a classical uh, area of destruction of uh, coagulative necrosis that occurs when you use the standard cyclodiode. Whereas if you look at these pictures of the MPTCP, they look virtually unchanged. And this all fits in with some histological um, evidence also about the mechanism of action of micropulse. The idea actually is that it works on outflow and is a very non-destructive procedure. And it causes make it like a slow cook of the area. So what that essentially does is makes the area more susceptible to uh, aqueous outflow via a uveoscleral approach. This has been evidenced also by finding latex spheres in the aura serrata. And actually there was a change to change the name of this treatment from what was originally going to be a um, cyclophotocoagulation to a cyclophototherapy. A very simple treatment is uh, performed where you place it perpendicular to the sclera here and you slowly move it around between the top half and the inferior half as well. Now, there wasn't very much guidance about the speed, how much you press, how much uh, viscoelastic coupling agent to use, but recently at WGC, they came out with these new guidelines on how it should be used ideally, and we've been putting them into practice. I'll be showing you some of our local data on this right now. So here's a short video to show the difference between TCP the, with the pops and MPTCP, which is just slowly moving this around the eye. And this is the sort of speed that you should be doing it at. Slowly moving it around, and it's in a different position and different angulation to the TCP. This is the use of a coupling agent. As you can see, the laser spot becomes a lot more focused when it's put into the coupling agent. And when it's outside, it's not so focused. Here it's focused, and then it's not so focused. It is asymmetrical as well. So and if you look on how it's being used, you can see a wide variety of, of methods. Even on YouTube now, if you pull up videos of Micropulse TCP, you can see it being used with this end towards limbus and this end towards the lid in some cases. The correct way is this blunt end is towards the lid. Now you can see how it should be used like this, not like this and this angulation as opposed to either of these two. These results from our center, uh, looking at um, what we've been um, using for the last few, few years now. And you can see that comparing tube TCP and MPTCP, you've got vastly different curves. The tube group comes down uh, 
from very low level to about 26 IOP and stays very low to about 12. You can see that MPTCP has been traditionally used in much more uh, re uh, recalcitrant and difficult to treat glaucomas comes down very dramatically and finishes up around about 18, 19. And, and the MPTCP has also a very much more gradual approach. In this study that we did, we looked at the uh, about 90 patients with MPTCP and about 30 in TCP and tube group. And we had a similar age group, male gender, and a similar number which had primary and secondary glaucomas. The only big difference, though, was in their pre-op visual acuities. The TCP group had far worse visual acuities. And this is also evident on their uh, visual field mean deviation as well. If you look at the number of retreatments that had to be applied, over one-third of the MPTCP had to have another procedure. If you look at what was actually done, many of them was a repeat MTC, MPTCP, but some were glaucoma filtration surgery, glaucoma drainage devices, and even a traditional TCP as well. In the traditional TCP group, a few people had a MPTCP. Of course, in the uh, tube group, they only had tube revisions and laser PIs. So to use our results and compare them to other studies, we can see the results of uh, Ziad's group in um, Lebanon here at the bottom, our group here, and this is the uh, group from NUS, the original study, looking at recalcitrant glaucomas. You can see the curves are quite similar, but obviously very overlapping uh, um, in confidence interv intervals. Now, the original studies that looked at the time and energy said that you should be using about 160 and 100 millijoules. But some of these studies, that especially for refractory glaucomas, were using much, much more, 320 seconds and 300 seconds. And those, as I was saying, how you do these actual lasers, you put half on top and half on bottom. So to get 160 seconds, you'd be doing 80 on the top and 80 seconds on the bottom. So for when you were doing 320, this is like quite a lot more than what was the original projected time of the laser procedure uh, for, for the, what the Iridex was originally planning. Now, Ziad's group has produced a much more a reasonable value here for uncontrolled glaucoma patients that quite, span quite a variety of those with good visual acuities, not so advanced, all the way to the recalcitrant ones as well. Now, of course, in the refractory glaucomas, when you do pump the power up, you do get a, more of an effect. And the results here show up to 40 to 50% IOP lowering. But of course, what comes with that is significant amounts of inflammation, up to 41%. In the moderate to severe glaucomas, which are much more milder than the re refractory ones, you can see 30% uh, IOP reduction with a reduction in medications as well. What is definitely can, you can see here is in the better safety and pain profile. Whilst performing the micropulse, you can see that actually it probably doesn't cause much less pain at the time compared to a traditional continuous wave cyclodiode, but in the post-op period, it definitely seems to seem to be causing less pain. We also know that people use more power as they you look at the more recalcitrant glaucomas. So as the vision worsens, you put more power in and you get more IOP lowering. And this is done by simply adjusting these figures on the board. Now to look at the cost benefit analysis, you can reuse the probe and that changes things dramatically. Although we're not allowed to in our center, it's got a 90 minute cutoff. And in that 90 minutes, it's possible to do it six times, which makes it much more affordable. There's extremely low rates of thysis and hypotony as well, but you have to balance that against high redo rates. In our center, the the probe actually costs another 500 US dollars more than traditional TCP. But because it's safe, it does potentially open up a much larger market. Instead of just going for the recalcitrant glaucomas, you can also go for the ones with good vision now. Now, there's no cost of life, sorry, quality of life versus cost effectiveness data on this. So this is an area that we should be going into. But it seems as though because of this very safe profile that this laser has, it can be used much more early. And this means that it can be used almost in like a souped up SLT. So in cases where you would not normally consider doing an MPT, a normal, a normal continuous wave laser, you might do a MPTCP. So in conclusion, it's an interesting technology. It has a very good safety profile with, with variable efficacy. And it's definitely repeatable but unfortunately may have to be repeatable many times. And it'd be interesting to see the results of some studies that will look at getting the ideal laser parameters. Thank you very much.
Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, how, if you have a patient with refractory glaucoma, or how does, in comparison to like transscleral CPC, do you, you know, we, in the United States, we usually block these people, and with the micropulse, we usually have to do it in the operating room, whether with transscleral, we usually can do it in the clinic. I think the micropulse is a little bit more painful. Um, how does that fit into your whole armamentarium? Do you take them to the, the operating room? Yep. Do you choose one or the other, and how do you choose those between these two treatments? Right, so at the moment, um, we published on some of the, the causes of hypotony after traditional uh, continuous wave laser. We found that actually one of the, the largest causes of hypotony was having a previous diagnosis of neovascular glaucoma. Because you have some ciliary body shut down as well, ischemic ciliary body not producing enough fluid, and a blocked up trabecular mesh work that's not draining anything either. So hence because of that, and because of the ex good safety profile that this has, we've been using these TCBs, especially in the secondary glaucomas and those of the um, uh, neovascular type. However, because it's been so safe, we've been also using in relatively good eyes, whereas previously our standard proce process for dealing with uh, very high IOPs, county fingers or worse, straight away to a psychodiet. In terms of the pain as well, it's very interesting. We've got very uh, mixed thoughts about how much pain it causes. Some people are actually doing it under subconj anesthetic, but I'm surprised at that because I think it's exactly the same as a psychodiet procedure. I probably maybe a touch more like your, mm -hmm. your response as well. But um, definitely what's been shown is in the post-op period, because there's less inflammation, the patient feels it less. So Shamira, the, the energy you and the timing is variable like from 160 to 320. Yes. And the second issue is the position of the ciliary body. So like you do in patients who have juvenile glaucoma versus elder glaucoma, the ciliary body position is variable. Right. But here it's one size fits all. So I think isn't, isn't that a drawback with the current technology? Right. So the, it, when with, tr with traditional psychodiet, as you say, the ciliary body could be anywhere in post-traumatic places, neovascular, in congenital glaucoma, with boot you know, it could be anywhere. So hence, we traditionally almost always use a light pipe to delineate that area. Now, the point of this is that it's less dependent on cyclodestruction and more on this outflow procedure through the uveus field pathway. And if you just go back a further amount, you're hitting the pars placata, the pars planar area, and that's the part that's meant to be used. So hence, the placement is, is a bit more forgiving. The only thing you do have to do is get the laser perpendicular to the area, because that means that it's kind of like more focused on the correct area that it's treating. And what is your post-operative regimen after you give this? How long do you give steroids or do you give non steroidal anti-inflammatory? Right, so traditionally, my traditional answer to this is you would try to treat it to the um, inflammation in the, in the eye. And we would see our patients normally at two weeks post-operative, having had them on uh, Q3H, Maxidex, and Levofloxacin. Then we would see how the results were and uh, uh, probably tell it over the next, next two weeks. And if it doesn't work, how soon can you repeat? So in our study, we were repeating it at three months. Unfortunately, that is, for me, a bit of a disappointment. I, I must say, that's one of the things that I uh, had to, to deal with, you know, explaining to patients that it, really nothing has happened. But uh, I, I think, yeah, there's, the great news is that there's no real harm. We haven't had any severe hypotenuse yet. Question from the audience, go ahead. Actually, we haven't needed to because there is very little inflammation. So you just ha use antibiotic steroid combination, just that, and taper it off at around four weeks or two weeks? Total of four weeks. Total we'll four have weeks. a look at them at two weeks. There's no point having a look at them the next day. Okay. And the next question was, how do you ensure uh, that the probe is perpendicular? How do you ensure that, you know, the probe is perpendicular? Because it needs to be angulated. So, um... How do you ensure that, you know, you have to... You, to make it perpendicular, you're, ac you're actually not sure, you know? Well, unlike the G-probe, which is cupped to yeah. get to the right angle, this is just straight, like it's like a pencil. Okay, so, so you just so paint around. So it's just your perception that it is perpendicular? That just Correct. That. And the addition of a coupling fluid is really useful. We weren't using a coupling fluid originally, but can you see from yeah. the, the video, it's, it's really a lot more focused, a lot more forgiving. If you tilt it slightly without coupling fluid, 
the, the laser is very so unfocused. So what type of coupling fluid you were using? So we use any sort of gel, uh, visitic gel. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And uh, one more question, have you used it in good vision patients? And what, what, was, what were the, uh, you know, any complications that you've noted? No, that's exactly right. So we're using it far earlier than what we would normally do. And especially in the US, I hear that uh, this is one of the more common uses, which puts it more like a souped up SLT. Unfortunately, you have to take the patient to the theater, but it's giving you kind of that result. And there's, if you think about it, in some practices, there's quite a lot of patients who that could treat. Uh, but have you, you know... No, no uh, problems in that group, no, yeah. No we haven't problems. had anyone who's going, going hypotenuse. Okay. Or any other complications of... Inflammation is the biggest one. Okay. Because there are, uh, in literature, there are studies which says that, you know, there was uh, around in, I think, 10 of their 60 eyes, which is around 10% of the cases, they had, uh, you know, a decrease in vision by two lines, and there was cataract progression. Yeah. So those are... are maybe we haven't followed them up for long enough. That's the other thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one more question. My question is about your uh, the patients who required retreatment. You said 30 percent. Yes. Uh, so were these patients who showed no response at all in the first sitting, and you wanted, or were they people who had some amount of response, and you wanted to sort of uh, add on, uh, you know, further intraocular pressure reduction? Right. In almost all the cases, there's an initial drop in IOP. Even with your TCP cases, there's an initial drop. But it just seems to go back to exactly to the same level, square, back to square one. So thank you, Shamira. We'll go on to the next talk, and that is what is really a new advance in glaucoma, gene therapy for glaucoma. And for that, we have Professor Tin Ong, who is the director of the Singapore Eye Research Institute. Oh, thank you very much. So I'd like to first say that uh, I don't work on gene therapy in glaucoma. I do work on genetics of glaucoma, but uh, not on gene therapy. But Tanuj gave me a very difficult topic to talk about. And also, it says something very new. I have no disclosures. So um, when we talk about gene therapy, we're talking about correction of genetic defects, either by gene replacement or gene modulation, and hopefully to emulate symptoms by delivery of this therapeutic uh, target. So in ideal therapy, of course, the expression occurs in the target cells in the desired amount in a time-dependent manner. It's non-pathogenic, non-immunogenic, non-toxic, and hopefully with a single administration, you get long-term expression. Now, today I'll give you an overview of the talk in terms of the, why the eye is a very good organ for gene therapy and how successful we are in the field of gene therapy, particularly for retinal dystrophies and Leber's congenital amaurosis, for example, and give an overview of glaucoma genetics and how gene therapy could be used for glaucoma and including some currently on trials. So let's start with the eye. Why is the eye a good target organ for gene therapy? I think, you, as you know, it's a highly uh, compartmentalized and we have uh, easy delivery for the vectors that can be delivered into the eye within microsurgical techniques. And we probably, it's more, because it's compartmentalized, you don't have much systemic uh, side effects. The tissues are small, with small volumes required. And you know, the eye has got immune privileges. The immune response is usually not too great. We have optical transparency, and we can measure things easily. We can measure the, quantify the visual function, both psychophysically as electrophysiology as well. And also we have the foreign contralateral eye as a control. So these are very re good reasons why the eye is good for gene therapy. And in, there's lots of new virus uh, vectors now that are, can be used for eye gene therapy, and also animal models. And of course, you know, for retinal dystrophies, we have the subretinal space, which is uh, very close to the target for the, the gene therapy, which is the photoreceptors or RPE. And you can have very concentrated delivery whereas with, with immune privileges. So these are very good advantages. So let's talk about gene therapy for retinal dystrophies. And this is a very big field, a very hot field. And as you know, retinal dystrophy is a common blinding disease, affects about one in 2,000 people. And these people, many of them have progressive visual loss and blindness. And until the advent of gene therapy, many people have no definite treatment, and these people just go progressively blind, some of them in uh, young adulthood, and, for, and then permanent, permanent blindness. So if you could deliver, uh, correct it with gene therapy, this would be an ideal disease. And there are two kinds of retinal dystrophies, as you know, recessive ones, in which case there's loss of function of a gene for which you should aim for gene replacement. 
and then dominant diseases where there's some mutant gene transcripts in which you need to either aim for suppression or replacement strategies. So the first world uh, FDA approved uh, gene therapy, of course, is RP65 for Leber's control amaurosis, and I'll talk about this in a while. And there's several others on clinical trials, including uh, autosomal recessive RP, Usher syndrome, star guts, and choroidemia, and further others under preclinical studies. So let's talk about Leber's congenital amaurosis first. And this is a very severe blinding disease, and many of them are caused by RP65, uh, this gene called RP65 mutations. And this RP65 is essential for the production of 11 cis retinol, which is the immediate precursor to 11 cis retinol. Okay? And there's a good animal model, is it's a dog model, a briar dog, which is similar to human uh, RP65. They also get the same kind of a blindness. They are normal at birth, and then they start losing the ERG signal at five months. Then they get both day and night blindness. And there are some, uh, ho some homozygous mutation, RP65, which also has similar human uh, analogous uh, mutations. So this bright dog was used uh, as a gene therapy trial. And this is a dog, uh, Lancelot, which was, they delivered a subretinal delivery of the AAV uh, vector with the RP65 gene, and it has in substantial improvement in visual function. And the several follow-up studies were conducted. And here you can see up to three to four years visual improvement after one delivery. So this was an amazing uh, result in this dog model. And uh, the dog uh, continues to still see well since 2000. So that was uh, delivered in 2000, and now almost 20 years later, the dog has, uh, still has good uh, vision. And uh, apparently more than 50 dogs have been treated in a similar way. So this was the proof of concept on animal uh, model of gene, how gene therapy works. And so this led to the RSP65 uh, Leber's control amaurosis trials in 2008. And there was, uh, in 2008, um, there was uh, several uh, publications of the effect of the RP65 gene therapy. And one was from the Morefields group, uh, one from uh, Gene Bennett in Philadelphia, and another group from the US. So these were successful gene therapy trials. So this led to the creation of a company called uh, Spark Therapeutics, and this is by Gene Bennett's group. And this was the first uh, FDA-approved drug for a one-time gene therapy for patients with certain RP65 mutations in uh, LCA. So this was big news, and uh, as you know, it is now uh, approved and in some countries in the US as well as in, uh, in Europe. The insurance may uh, pay for this therapy. And uh, Novartis has since uh, licensed or uh, this Lux Turner, and so now it's a relationship between Lux Turner and uh, Spark, and it's uh, very expensive. Unfortunately, it's like a few hundred thousand uh, dollars for for one therapy. But you know, it's uh, almost the vision of the patient improves uh, drastically. So from previous almost blindness, they can get um, navigational uh, vision, and even uh, in some people, they will be able to have some um, qual good quality of life. So. And, and this is a major uh, landmark for gene therapy for ophthalmology. And there are others which are under, uh, under, under companies as Nightstar, which is working on uh, choroidemia, and uh, Avaxis, Coitera, et cetera. So these are all gene therapy companies which are already doing trials in humans. There's also, of course, a gene therapy for Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And uh, this is uh, another exciting field which possibly could lead to uh, improvement in vision. So let's talk about glaucoma. Can you do gene therapy for glaucoma? Now, as you know, we have patients with glaucoma who have progression of blindness in spite of excellent IOP control, even after trapeculectomy. And these are the patients who progressively get worse. And these are the ones where, you know, whatever we do, they keep going down and they get blindness. So this is one potential group, of course. Whether we could uh, potentially, you know, target the RGC Perhaps you can also target the trabecular meshwork of the optic nerve head. So these are potential target areas for uh, gene therapy for glaucoma. So let's look at glaucoma genes. Now, as you know, there's a certain proportion of glaucoma is uh, inherited as a Mendelian or dominant uh, fashion. So for example, myosin is one of the major uh, Mendelian genes for glaucoma. And this probably accounts for about 5 to 10% of POAG. And these are pedigrees. And there are also other genes like optinurin, which is more like a, can cause more like a normal tension glaucoma, WDR36, ASB10. So these are dominant uh, uh, forms of glaucoma which are, we have in some of our patients. 
We also have congenital glaucoma like CYP1B1, LDB2, which are, as you know, our con uh, recessive diseases. But the vast majority of our glaucoma are complex, which means that they have genetic risk factors only. They don't have like a one major mutation or one major uh, um, gene that's responsible for the glaucoma. So in most of our patients that we have glaucoma, they have so-called genetic risk factors. And for that, um, you need to use a GWAS approach or genome-wide association study to find genetic risk factors. And several GWASs have been done. For, for open ankle glaucoma, you can see here more than 20 uh, uh, genetics genes have been identified for genetic risk factors with small effect sizes of between 1.1 and 1.2. But what's more important is that from the GWAS, you can see that some of the pathways that have been identified, and these include um, you know, the mitochondrial pathways, lipid pathways, et cetera. And so people are now looking, can these, some of these be targets for gene therapy? So let me give you an overview now of some of these potential targets. So for example, for the Mendelian group, the myosin, has worked now on doing a CRISPR gene editing for some of these mutations. Which, which can improve a protein aggregation. And this is work that's done in Iowa and others. Then for the GWAS hits, there are several targets here. One of them is TK, and, uh, which are related to Schlem's canal development. So this could be a target to improve the Schlem's canal uh, function. And others for lipid metabolism, and others for mitochondrial dysfunction. So these are potential therapies which are targets for gene therapy, but these are, of course, a long way off. So let's go, what's closer to, to currently is the uh, target of the retinal ganglion cells. So this is something which is already going to clinical trials. And basically for retinal ganglion cells, we have three approaches. You can try stem cells or gene therapies to try to regenerate or improve their function. And the group uh, led by Keith Martin in Australia, formerly from Cambridge, is targeting RGC survival and they are using a target of BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which they found to be a target, and this, that by upregulating this gene, it protects against RNCC loss and is neuroprotective, and this is in, done in several animal models. So I'll share with you the next few slides, uh, data from uh, Keith Martin, and basically he started off by uh, doing a rat uh, glaucoma model and they found that using AAV with the brain derived neuro, uh, neurotropic factor, they had improved uh, rescue of RGCs after four weeks of experimental glaucoma. And then uh, they, they did several models, an optic crush model again, showing again increase in RGC survival. And then they did another model, a trabecular laser model, where they induced uh, high pressures by lasering the trabecular meshwork of the, of the rat. And again, they found that applying this BDNF gene therapy, it was strongly neuroprotective in this model with a good uh, RGC exon preservation in the long, in a, in a long term. And it even led to increased optic nerve con connectivity to the brain. So this was quite amazing results from this target of BDNF. And also they showed also uh, not only in, in terms of IOP and connectivity, and RGC loss, also improvement of ERG function as well. So these are some evidence of how BDNF could be a target for gene therapy. And now the, the company called Acutera is starting a clinical trial in humans to test out uh, gene therapy of BDNF through an intra vitreal application. And this will then upregulate the BDNF in the RGCs of the retina. So this is something which is already going to start, and they're targeting people who have progressive glaucoma in spite of good intracranial pressure. These are people who are progressing in spite of good intracranial pressure control, so something else is going on in these people. Finally, a uh, couple of slides on whether we could target the trabecular mesh work, and this is work from uh, Paul Kaufman's group from Wisconsin, and there are several genes, I put it gene X here, because it's, I think it's proprietary, to try to target the mesh work to upregulate upflow of trabecular mesh work. And uh, my colleague, Pereira, Shamira Pereira here, He's working at Paul Coffin in Singapore, so they're working on primate studies. So they're delivering this uh, vector, or again, AAV vector, through little catheters, like 125 microns, into the Schlem's canal, like a canaloplasty procedure. And this is, um, this is some of the work that he sh they shared with me. And you can see here, they, they're using a GFP antibody, which is a coloring antibody, 
to show the principle of how you can upregulate uh, in the meshwork itself. We can see the red staining here to show that it can be delivered into the, into the canal and the Schlems Canal and tropical meshwork area via the canaloplasty. And this is a work that Chamura actually canalates the monkeys. So, you know, he, he's very expert on canalating monkeys, so I'm sure it's no problem canalating humans. Yeah. So I think in summary, uh, you know, we are on the cusp of um, new gene therapy for glaucoma. As I told you earlier, it's already established in the retinal dystrophies. We have an FDA-approved drug for lesers, condylar amaurosis, and there are different approaches, as I mentioned. Some of them could be targeting um, the RGC, some would be are targeting the trabecular meshwork, others could be targeting gene targets such as GWAS hits as well as myosilin. And of course, we need to think about how gene therapy will fit relative to other treatment strategies, not like a retinal dystrophies where it's all blind and you have, we have to rescue the one with one gene therapy. Here, as you know, for glaucoma, we have multiple approaches to treating glaucoma and which targets are most promising and who are the ones who will need this gene therapy. So there are still lots of questions to be answered. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, Chan Choi Man, uh, Keith Martin, and of course, Paul Kaufman and Shamir Pereira for help with some of the slides. Thank you for your attention. Um, so it was a really fantastic talk, and I was just curious about the BDNF. That would, that would theoretically work with all glaucoma patients where um, maybe a specific gene we don't really have for most of our glaucoma patients. Is that the big attraction for the BDNF? Or? Okay, so the BDNF is to improve RG survival, so I suppose it could be used for all forms of glaucoma. But obviously, you know, we have other treatments like IOP lowering and others, so, you know, probably you probably need to use it in a subgroup of them who are rapidly progressing in spite of good IOP levels or people who are in, you know, you don't find a, a, a way of arresting their progression. So this is probably the group. I don't think you will be using it for everybody, you know, because it, probably the cost will be too high and uh, the other risks. But definitely, in that subgroup patients who are rapidly progressing with no other um, options available for us, mm. in spite of our maximum efforts in IP lowering, this would probably be a good group. Mm. Yeah. I was also curious about um, the BDNF, if you were looking for cells that were sick or you know, patients who had low pressure already and they continue to progress, um, do you think it would be need to be paired with maybe some adaptive optics or some sort of way of figuring out why these patients are continuing to progress? I think, you know, we don't know. Some people, we, we, we have patients who will progress regardless of whatever we do, <laughs> and we don't know what's the reasons, what's happening in them, you know, is it? Sometimes, like, you know, I worked on a family with optinurin mutations. They got pressures of 10 to 12, but all rapidly progressed to ex uh, extensive uh, visual field loss and blindness. You know? so, so some of them are really genetic. Uh, others, we don't know whether it's a mixture of um, blood flow, or biomechanics, you know, we, we don't know. Yeah. Great. One last question. Um, you know, it's common for our patients to ask us about whether they should be tested for glaucoma with genetic testing. Do you have any comments about that, and is it useful, and, and who should we recommend? Okay. So currently, um, I think if you have a strong pedigree, yes, you should test them. If they have a very strong family history, you should test them. And uh, there are several genes which have Mendelian inheritance. Apparently, about for the GWAS, I think there's no need to test at the moment because it's not going to improve um, at the moment. So there's no test available, and the predictive value is very limited. Although the recent uh, UK Biobank study showed that if you combine all the GWAS hits currently, you can predict up to, pick up to 70% of glaucoma's oh. POAG. So you know, this could be something in the future. As you work out more of the genetic mechanism, you can predict. But I think you know, at the moment, about 70% of glaucoma can be detected. Thank you. Any questions from the from the crowd? Go next. Yeah, okay. Oh, our next speaker is going to be Tanuj uh, Dada, uh, right here from uh, Delhi, and he's going to be talking about the brain as a target in glaucoma. So, can you put up the slides? So I'll be introducing a new concept. 
सो वी हैव बीन यूज टू ट्रीटिंग ग्लोकोमा बेस्ड ऑन मेडिकल थेरेपी और लेजर्स और सर्जरी so there is a new concept emerging and that is harnessing the inner pharmacy of the brain for modulating your hormones which have a direct impact on the intraocular pressure can you just check this is this not moving so you all of you are aware of the ancient science of yoga that is about 5000 years old and it was put in a standard form by sage patanjali and this involves basically eight different aspects of yoga and the key features are physical postures breath awareness breathing and meditation so for glaucoma patient we are not concerned with any physical exercise the focus in is to have a breath awareness focus on breathing and do meditation as a relaxation exercises to decrease the intraocular pressure now meditation broadly is classified into two categories one is focus attention that means you focus your thoughts on your breath a mantra or a sound and the second type is called open monitoring me meditation where you just observe your thoughts the basic purpose of these exercises is to induce relaxation and to regulate attention so that you can detach from your thoughts and lead to a state of mental equanimity if you see the physiology of meditation whenever you sit in meditation it leads to what is known as the relaxation response now this is a response of the parasympathetic nervous system which is a mind body state to counter the stress response so if you see any form of meditation or relaxation exercises in phys physiological terms it is leading to what is known as a relaxation response in the body now why this is important for us to understand you are all aware that if you have chronic stress you get systemic hypertension or high blood pressure but you are not aware of the effect of stress on the intraocular pressure so whenever a glaucoma patient comes to your opd you ask the patient did you take any form of steroid this is the most important question we ask the patient but what we forget we should also be asking the patient about any psychosocial or emotional stresses because whenever you have stress you have increase in endogenous cortisol and that can lead to a increase in intraocular pressure so this is a very important concept to understand increased stress can raise endogenous cortisol and that can lead to a increase in intraocular pressure especially because you know that glaucoma patients are already high steroid responders so if they get high levels of endogenous cortisol the intraocular pressure can shoot up and this has already been shown that glaucoma patients and patients of ocular hypertension have increased levels of plasma cortisol the second important concept that is now emerging is that glaucoma is no longer eye disease it is classified as a neurodegeneration and you must have seen all these theories in various glaucoma lectures that glaucoma is caused by the apoptosis of retinal ganglion cells due to very variety of causes like ischemia oxidative injury glutamate and decrease in bdnf as we were just discussing inflammation and nitric oxide dysfunction but currently we are only reducing the intraocular pressure but recent studies have shown on mri imaging that there is a transsynaptic degeneration affecting the occipital cortex and the lateral genicular body so the brain emerges as a current therapeutic target for glaucoma because there is injury not only in the optic nerve but in the cortex and the lateral geniculate body now you have to understand that when once you have increase in stress and a rise in cortisol the cortisol destroys the hippocampal neurons and this is a vicious cycle so you have stress you have release of cortisol that causes destruction of the hippocampal neurons which causes loss of memory and dementia and this further increases stress so this is a vicious cycle that is important for neurodegenerative diseases and this may be one of the factors why we often say that glaucoma patients have poor compliance or they fail to remember how when to take medicines these are very famous studies done on aging the macarthur studies 
and the cognitive decline in elderly has directly been associated with increased cortisol. The good news is that this the effect on the brain is reversible if you lower the cortisol. We all know that glaucoma patients have a poor quality of life, they have dementia, they have poor psychosocial function, greater anxiety levels and furthermore whenever you start therapy up to a glaucoma patient actually the quality of life worsens because of the side effects of medicines. So they have a poor quality of life but we are not doing anything for this, we are just giving them eye drops which may worsen the disease itself. Now what is the impact of meditation on the human brain? This is the first studies done from the US in Harvard Medical School actually bring evidence that meditation leads to neurogenesis in the adult brain and this is the first study done from the Harvard Medical School by Sarah Lazar in which they found that this graph is of the normal aging population and this one is of the meditator. So what they found that meditation offsets age related cortical thinning. So patients who are meditating the cortex is not thinning as compared to the control population where there is a cortical thinning with age and this was also shown to be significant in the occipital cortex. Now this is a cross-sectional study so there was a limitation to the study and these are the meta-analysis of 21 neuroimaging studies in which they found that there is definitely increase in grey matter synthesis in the brain on MRI imaging studies and this is a longitudinal 8 week study of meditation and what they found that even with 8 weeks of meditation there is increase in grey matter concentration on high definition MRI studies. Now what about white matter? Meditators have been shown to have increase in white matter density in the brain which does an arrest in the decline with age and the mechanism that have been shown on MRI are there is an increase in myelination, increase in axon density, diameter and the fiber geometry in meditators and this is a very nice study. They calculated the brain age index. This is a artificial intelligence based algorithm which calculates the age of the brain based on MRI imaging and what they found was that the brain of meditators was 7.5 years younger as compared to controls. So this is a very significant finding and actually you can see that meditation is beneficial for brain preservation and this is a evidence of neuroprotection that we have been looking for in glaucoma. And we all keep on discussing about cerebral blood flow and the ocular blood flow. So glaucoma patients have a decreased ocular blood flow as well as a decreased cerebral blood flow on MRI imaging studies and the blood flow is also reduced in the visual cortex which is directly correlated to the visual field defect. So the big question is can we enhance blood flow? So this is not possible with any therapy but what they found was imaging the brain with SPECT scan with meditation you can increase the cerebral blood flow. This is a very significant finding from various studies done on the FRM uh, functional MRI imaging and the SPECT scan and this is a study that we did at RP Center Ames with the Department of Physiology. So this is the instrument which is used to measure the oxygenation of the brain. This is called SPECT scanning and this is a functional near infrared spectroscopy scan. And what we found was that after six weeks of meditation in glaucoma patient there was significant increase in oxygenation of the brain and what you were discussing there was an upregulation of BDNF. So we found that it's quite good for glaucoma patients and this is a new apparatus that we have acquired which is specifically focused on the occipital imaging of the oxygenation of the brain and you can see after six weeks of meditation there is an increase in the occipital oxygenation in glaucoma patients. Then we keep on discussing about glutamate and this is a magnetic resonance spectroscopy that picks up biochemical changes in the brain and what was found was there was a reduction in cerebral glutamate levels on MRI imaging in patients who are meditators. And another important concept that we need to discuss is about autonomic dysfunction because patients of normal pressure glaucoma like Dr. Tin was mentioning the IOP is controlled but the disease progresses and that is because these patients have an inherent abnormality in the sympathetic nervous system. They have an increased sympathetic activity and a decrease in the parasympathetic activity and this is measured by what is known as heart rate variability. The better the heart rate variability, better is the autonomic function 
but what they found was that glaucoma patients have a poor heart rate variability and they have a autonomic dysfunction and this autonomic dysfunction is directly correlated with the visual field progression because if you have a sympathetic predominance you get vasoconstriction and a decreased blood supply to the optic nerve head now the big question is what can we do about it and this is a new frontier of science the brain over body can you willfully regulate autonomic dysfunction and what they found was just with 5 days of meditation practice you can regulate the autonomic function by decreasing parasympathetic uh, decreasing sympathetic activity and increasing the parasympathetic because there is a better regulation of the autonomic nervous system by the frontal cortex and finally glaucoma patients have a lot of associated systemic disease when a patient walks in he may be having diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease so what is the impact of meditation on these chronic diseases this is from the american heart association they have found that meditation is a reasonable adjunct to the already applied therapy for cardiovascular risk reduction and this is the very famous article from circulation what they found was with a short course of meditation there was a 48% risk reduction mortality due to reduction in blood pressure and decrease in stress so in addition to handling the ocular disorders the you can help the patients in various other cardiac psychiatric physical disorders so meditation is quite helpful for number of reasons and finally why do we do meditation focus on breathing from the nose so this is a very important concept to understand when you do slow deep breathing you directly stimulate the nasal receptors and this is con connected to the olfactory bulb so this is the, the nasal mucosa is very highly innervated so when you see people doing yoga in the morning and doing alternate nostril breathing that is not for oxygenation you are actually stimulating the nasal receptors that is stimulating the olfactory bulb which is modulating the cortical and brain stem function so just by reducing the breathing rate to less than 6 breaths per minute you can change the cognition of the brain this is a very nice study this is a intracranial eeg so you remove the scalp and the electrodes are placed on the surface of the brain and what they found was when the patient breathes through the nose there is a spike in the eeg so this is a proof that there is a respiratory modulation of the cognition just by changing your breathing you can change the autonomic function as well as change your cognitive abilities and this is a very nice article published in scientific american and you can see the heading proper breathing brings better health so people who cannot do meditation they have advocated 365 breathing three times a day reduce the number of breaths six per minute for five minutes and that can regulate the functioning of the autonomic nervous system and reduce your stress anxiety as well as the intraocular pressure and summing all this up this is the first randomized control trial that we did that was published on the effect of meditation on the intraocular pressure and we found that with the 21 days of meditation one hour a day there was a 25% reduction in intraocular pressure a uh, improvement in the quality of life and you can see a massive reduction in the levels of cortisol inflammatory markers like interleukin 6 and there was a change in the gene expression a lot of genes were up regulated and down regulated and you should understand why this can be so significant we have had patients who get a tremendous drop in intraocular pressure and the mechanisms are basically a parasympathetic activation you have a central regulation but more importantly what we found was there is increased level of plasma melatonin in meditators and melatonin has a direct impact on the intraocular pressure in addition to the beta blockers and other alpha agonists it can independently reduce the intraocular pressure so melatonin is a drug to reduce intraocular pressure secondly by stimulating the hypothalamus you can directly reduce intraocular pressure and finally we found we took a trabecular meshwork specimen from patients who went into a trial of meditation and underwent trabeclectomy and we found that the nitric oxide levels were greatly increased due to the increased level of nitric oxide synthetase so these are the mechanisms meditation can directly release nitric oxide and you must be knowing new drugs which contain nitric oxide that have been released so in summary meditation this is the article just published in february issue of journal of glaucoma meditation is a poly pill for glaucoma you can see 
multiple mechanisms reducing IOP, increasing blood flow, improving oxidative stress, autonomic dysfunction, glutamate, impacting neurodegeneration, quality of life, and affecting other diseases. So my take home message is that you should treat the eye as well as the patient behind the eye and give the patient a chance if they do these meditation exercises, they get rid of the stress due to glaucoma and also the intraocular pressure goes down. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you uh, such, for such a fantastic talk. And um, patients commonly ask, like, what can I do to help with my glaucoma? And I'll mention exercise, and I'll also mention uh, meditation. Do how much, what proportion of your patients, when you tell them to do meditation, actually follow through with doing meditation? So I think follow through is about, I would say, uh, 40 to 50 percent. Most of them, they start off and then they don't <laughs> carry over. But the ones who are advanced and who are, you know, shortage for surgery, they are the ones who get motivated. Mm. So they are the ones who have been continuing a lot. Mm. And they have been off the OT list for quite some time. And, uh, oh, go ahead. Can you give the, can you give the mic, please? Microphone uh, to this gentleman here in the middle. The microphone's not working. And uh, I'm Sanjeev Mittal and sharing my views of regarding this. In 2014, a similar paper we I published and uh, that was not in a PubMed journal. And uh, this was regarding the autonomic nervous system effect on meditators and med non-meditators on two groups where I included my intraocular pressure measurement. but. Uh, uh, that uh, was just a lowering sort of thing. But recently, we have done one study, uh, with PG, th th thesis of MD thesis, and uh, where we took two groups, and that's an RCT, and uh, medit uh, people were doing some yogic breathings, yogic breathings, like the meditation way, mm. and uh, two yogic breathings, and uh, two techniques. And one group was on uh, medication, second group was on medication, plus uh, this te these two techniques, yogic breathing. Not meditation, just uh, yoga breathings. And we found our results were very impressive. Initially, the PG, when we, I allocated her the topic, she just smiled. She consulted her some friends in RP center. That uh, actually there won't be, it, it doesn't have any base into it. I told her, okay, let's see, like it can be something negative. But uh, then uh, surprisingly, then she also become excited because results are positive. So 20%, uh, we have sent it for publication now, this. So 20% decline has been seen with this therapy. So that's good news. I think it has a technique, lot of potential. Last decade, the research on meditation has really advanced a bit. And you see a lot of studies from US as especially because of the brain. This is the only technique where you can arrest brain aging. So now you see there's a lot of interest and I'm happy because this is our ancient Indian technique which we are not aware of ourselves. So we'll go on to the next topic and we have our star speaker, Dr. Steve Mansberger. <laughs> who has come all the way from United States of America. He's a chair and director of the Glaucoma Services at the DUSI Institute, Portland, Oregon. And it's a pleasure that he is with us and he'll be sharing experience with something which is going to come soon to India, the minimally invasive glaucoma procedures, what's known and what's missing. Stephen, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be here. Uh, I first want to act, ask the audience, who in this audience has used a MIGS? Can you just raise your hand? So we've got about four people. Okay, so um, these are my conflicts of interest and some of these are related to uh, MIGS, but the, the biggest conflict of interest is the last one there. And I'm con I consider myself a middle adopter of technology. So I waited about two or three years to get my first iPhone and then I got it. I wanted everybody else to figure out all the kinks and things and then I was gonna get my iPhone. And so same thing with me with the minimal invasive glaucoma procedures. I uh, will let other people try these out and then I'll eventually uh, jump in. But I'm experienced in eye stent, uh, endocycle photocoagulation, cannulaplasty, uh, goniotomy, and, um, and I do a lot of cataract surgery as well. So one of the, this is uh, George Spaeth, and uh, one of his uh, statements is, is innovation is an integral part of medical care. So we're always trying to improve our care. 
And, uh, and for glaucoma surgery, we want to have less risks, we want to have more benefits, and we have, want to have less costs. And so we're always trying to improve our therapy to do that. So this is a very busy slide, but I want to kind of show the audience how busy and how complicated uh, MIG surgery are in the United States. So what we have here on the right side is we have traditional glaucoma surgery. This would be your typical, uh, you know, Barveld and Ahmed implants, your trabeculectomy. And what we have on the left side is all of the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries that are currently being investigated. There's ECP, end of, uh, psych endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, which has been around for about 20 uh, years. We've got multiple different implants. We've got ways of cleaving or removing parts of the trabecular meshwork. Uh, Dr. Ung was talking about some of these injections which might get the trabecular meshwork to work better. Uh, we have ways of dilating the canal, Schlem's canal, to improve. And then there's implants that are also being tried. So one of the messages about this, when you see a slide like this and you see all these different therapies, what, one of the things you'll really realize is that there's probably not one that's winning out. And that's what we're finding out, is that some of these uh, treatments have uh, benefits in some people and some in not. So this is one of my clinic days. Uh, I have a 65-year-old radiologist who's got a history of herpes zoster, pigmentary glaucoma, steroid response, he has a scleral buckle for retinal detachment, and he hasn't had a laser. And his pressure is 36, and uh, his vision is 20-25 with a three-diopter three myopic shift from a cataract. And we're asking ourselves, do we want to do a standard glaucoma surgery on this guy, or do we want to do something else? I have a 58-year-old IT programmer who has uh, got glaucoma. He's intolerant to almost all of the eye drops. He's at SLT twice. His pressure is 22, his target's 14, and um, let me see if I can go back here. Uh, and anyway, he, let's see if I can go back. Can you go back a couple slides? I'm just trying to. Anyway, he's trying to decide whether or not he wants to have a traditional glaucoma surgery. Both of these patients said they didn't want a traditional glaucoma surgery. So this is uh, one option for them, is just standard cataract surgery. And this is a paper we published uh, several years ago looking at ocular hypertension patients. And you can see a large drop in pressure over time um, with cataract surgery, and the pressure stays low for a long time. So one of the messages about this is cataract is pretty forgiving. It improves their vision, and it also lowers pressure over a long period of time. Uh, and this is the typical change with just uh, cataract surgery. You get about, about somewhere about 70% uh, of patients will have uh, at least a 10% drop, and about 40% uh, of patients will have a 20 to 30% drop in pressure with just cataract surgery alone. And we know patients that have narrow angles will even get more lowering in pressure with cataract surgery alone. So cataract surgery is probably one of the most easiest and one of the best ways of doing a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. But it's not on that list. And this is just a snapshot of all the different uh, minimally invasive glaucoma procedures. This one on the right you can see here, uh, that's uh, the ECP. And uh, we saw the, minimum, we saw the uh, micropulse uh, lecture just a little bit ago. And this is just treating the ciliary body from within. We got viscocannulostomy down here. We have a gold Solex shunt that was placed in the suprachoroidal space. We have the eye stent. We've got um, a shunt that goes in the suprachoroidal space. We got the trabectome. We've got uh, the GAT procedure, which is a uh, gonioscopy assisted uh, transluminal, transluminal trabeculotomy. So we've got so many uh, procedures that we're trying. So what are the expected outcomes? Uh, if we remember, um, Conventional outflow. This is a study that was done by uh, one of our one of our fellows way back when, uh, named Rosenquist. And what he did was is he looked at uh, when you removed anywhere from one clock hour to twelve clock hours of the trabecular meshwork, and how much increased uh, or decrease in uh, flow you would get. And what he showed was that you can only eliminate approximately about forty to forty to sixty percent of the trabecular meshwork outflow, even when you remove the whole trabecular meshwork. So even if we do these mixed procedures through the conventional outflow pathway, we're only going to remove about 40 to 60% of the outflow uh, resistance. 
And that another consideration is episcleral venous pressure. This is a Goldman equation that averages between eight and 12 millimeters. And so if you're going to, um, if you need a low target pressure, that uh, with the going through the conventional outflow pathway, the most you can, the, the lowest you can get is eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. So again, if you need low pressure, uh, then you probably don't want to do one of these minimally invasive glaucoma procedures. So this is one of the uh, seminal papers looking at, at, at uh, the eye stent. And what you can see is uh, cataract uh, with the stent here in this, in this column, cataract alone in this column. And you can see that the pressure lowering is really very similar, about a 30% drop in the cataract alone and a 33% drop in the, in the eye stent. And uh, the medications after two years was very, very similar. So the reason this was approved in the United States was really not based on efficacy, it was based on safety, that this was very safe. So, but there were some patients that had got a really nice response. Uh, this is another uh, minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. This is placed in the suprachoroidal space. There's a little picture of here of this in the, in the corner. And you just place this, this just underneath scleral spur so it slips into the suprachoroidal space. And what you can see here on the slide is those that low pressures, there was very little difference when this was placed in the suprachoroidal space with expect, except for those that had higher pressures. Higher pressures had a, had a, a larger response with the suprachoroidal shunt. <coughs> and then this is a, another study looking at the trabectome. This is a device that removes the trabecular meshwork for uh, about two clock hours and about 20% success, which doesn't sound great. Uh, and a, but about 20% of those didn't require any further surgery. So even though it was only successful in 20%, it did work with them and kept their pressure low. And then what about cost? Um, these devices are very expensive. The eye stent costs about $2,000 uh, for this uh, for this stent. Most of them average between uh, $1,600 and uh, $2,400 for uh, U.S. dollars uh, for the cost. And um, so it's going to be interesting to see down the future if they've got just a small benefit in decreasing medicines and decreasing IOP, whether the U.S. government is going to continue to pay for these. So when is our consideration for MIGS? Early disease is probably uh, a good candidate. A target in the high teens, so somebody with a very high pressure who just needs to get in the teens. Um, when it's uh, and able to use medications, because most of these patients need to use medications, and whether they're willing to have another eye surgery in the future. Um, I want to remind everybody, this is a paper published in 1998. So uh, if I'm doing my math here, over 20 years ago. And this has looked, was a summary of all the different glaucoma implants that have been done since, uh, since 1907. And what you notice here is Many of these implants that we currently are trying and have been tried before. Uh, so right down here, we see a um, hydrogel stent, which is uh, very, very similar to the, the Zen stent. That was tried in 1995, and, and it just didn't work. Now, nowadays, we have mitomycin C, so maybe this would work. Uh, there's different, other different limbal stents. There's been uh, cyclodialysis stents. Uh, that have been tried. This was done in 1952. So we've tried these stents again, and so it's just going to be interesting to see whether just recapitulating uh, history or whether these will be, uh, be found to be beneficial. So the ideal glaucoma surgery only requires four things. Continuous IOP sensor, titrable adjustment of intraocular pressure, so just like a pacemaker, you could just turn your pacemaker, you can say you want your blood pressure at 80, uh, so just do that. Uh, outflow pathway of the eye and a short learning curve. This is just a video of, um, let's see if it'll play here. This is a video of a non-human primate uh, with a uh, intraocular pressure sensor from Crawford Downs who was at uh, our institution. And what you can see is these, um, the ability to check pressure, this is 100 times uh, or 500 times per second, and you can see this large variability in pressure. But we just need this device with a pumping mechanism uh, and we're, we've got now the perfect minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. So what happened to these two patients? The 65-year-old radiologist, I told him, you know, you might need a conventional glaucoma surgery, but let's just, and he said, and I go, but let's just try cataract alone. That's your major symptom. And he had cataract surgery alone and his pressure came down to 18 with no further medications. And I've been following now about two years. So he's done really, really well with this. 
Um, and actually, we added Latanoprost, and his pressure now is like 14. The 58-year-old IT programmer had a, um, had, a, had a trabeculotomy. His pressure is 18 on one drop alone. He does complain that he gets bleeding inside the eye periodically when he puts his head below his uh, heart, but he's been happy as well. So in summary, uh, cataract surgery lowers pressure in most patients. Uh, MIGS uh, surgeries using conventional outflow have IOPs in the high teens. Our unmet need is we don't understand which devices work in which person. Right now, it's just the surgeon who's comfortable on this device is that's what he does. And so I think soon we'll have a titratable pressure sensitive surgery in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was a very fascinating lecture outlining all the mixed devices. Any questions from the audience? I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mani Bhaskaran from Singapore National Eye Center who will be speaking on artificial intelligence in glaucoma screening. Thank you, Dr. Tanuj and uh, Jefferson, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I'll be talking about artificial intelligence in glaucoma screening. So what is artificial intelligence? It's a relatively loose term that is used to uh, mention about machine learning. So here, what is the machine? Computer. And what is it doing? Learning. To say yes or no. To keep, us, keep it very simple, yes or no. How do I go? Forward. Oh, okay. So uh, it is also called deep learning because the uh, newer softwares are so robust they thoroughly and completely analyze whatever data we give, whether it can be genetic data like what Professor Tin was telling about, or it can be medical images. Mostly we are talking about medical images, like say uh, imaging data or visual field data or fundus images. So when it comes to glaucoma, these are the three images that we have. And when these images are fed to the computers, they learn using certain uh, software systems called convolutional neural network system. So we'll come to that later, what it is about. But generally, it is simply that the software systems are so thorough, it is called deep learning methods. So it is nothing but advanced statistics plus certain algorithms, which will finally come to a conclusion, say, yes or no possible glaucoma or not, diabetic retinopathy or not. So you have heard from recently, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Google CEO, Sundar Pichai, he was talking about uh, diabetic retinopathy screening using his Google uh, uh, software system. That is simply an artificial intelligence system. Do we go through these artificial intelligence systems every day? If you have uh, flown across countries, yes. There are uh, fingerprint systems which convert the data into identification of an individual, there is artificial intelligence in it. So we are dealing with it daily, and uh, why not utilize it in glaucoma screening? Just want to clarify what is screening here. We are not talking about population screening, because we have a disadvantage when it comes to glaucoma. The prevalence of glaucoma is 4%. So when you have a disease which is low prevalent, you cannot do a population-wide screening. You can think about an opportunistic screening. Say, for example, you are screening a diabetic retinopathy, popula uh, diabetic population for diabetic retinopathy, you can also screen for glaucoma. Or if the patients are 60 and above, the glaucoma prevalence increases to 10 to 20 percent, depending upon the age group. And you can have the number of positive patients high. So you can do such opportunistic screening with such artificial intelligence systems. So when it comes to examination of a glaucoma suspect patients, it's not just a simple one-off fundus image and then go and say glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Because we have to check the intraocular pressure. If we, if we only look at fundus images, then we will lose ocular hypertensive patients. We may lose a narrow angle patient or a patient with visual field defect, but a uh, fundus image which is normal. We come across such patients, such, such as like, uh, uh, you know, it can be a preperimetric glaucoma where a fundus is abnormal, but visual fields is normal. So you need to have all this armamentarium. So when we are thinking about an artificial intelligence software, it should deal with all these investigations. So I'll quickly go through some of these uh, researches that have been done and some of the artificial intelligence softwares that have come out in publications. 
and probably some we are using it without us knowing and how they are dealing with this problem. So first to come to gonioscopy, we know that it is a contact procedure, subjective and only 50% patients in the clinic go through it, even less in some places. So we do have these alternatives to gonioscopy. When it comes to artificial intelligence softwares, there are two rules. One is the images should be acquired quickly because it is a screening procedure that we are looking at and it should be very simple, non-invasive possibly and then it should create a, a good resolution image. So when it comes to angle images, one is the ASOCT, another is something like a gonio photography system that can create angle images. Let us look at some of the experiences that we had. So based on visualization of the trabecular meshwork and scleral spur structures, we are determining whether the angle is closed or open. It can be qualitative mostly, whether it is open or closed, sometimes can be semi-quantitative. Cross-sectional views, we do have these wonderful images and then subsequently we have to do manual grading, it's quite laborious and again it also depends on the anatomical structures and this is where we get these artificial intelligence systems. Let's look at one of the things which we uh, have done in Singapore Eye Research Institute. So we tried to look at an automated analysis of the frontal angle images from a gonio photographic system. And this is the software system which simple, it's a simple machine learning that we uh, put in there, not a very complicated deep learning system. So it simply da does an edge detection and then it uh, uses something called a circular half method to detect the arc. And we surprisingly found that the uh, AUC for this is almost 0.96 to detect a two quadrant or a three quadrant gonioscopic angle closure. This is a simple example how a machine learning can work. Now let us look at these cross-sectional images. So initially, uh, before this deep learning software and all came in, we started working with just the visual features. So you can see that when you take a OCT image, the computer is uh, learned to detect the area of interest, that is the angle, and subsequently it localizes the angle and then binarizes it. This image is called a binarized image, just a black and white image. And subsequently the feature which is important is extracted. And then there is one important thing, the teacher because the machine is learning, the teacher is here is the ground truth. So you need a good clinician to go over all these images, say whether it is open or closed, whether it has glaucoma or not, like that. And subsequently that will be matched to these images and that's how the computer learns. And they subsequently use certain regression formulas or some histograms to find the uh, image whether it is open or closed. Now this initially had a accuracy of around 0.83, not good enough for screening. And subsequently, the people have used quantitative methods as well, but this needs segmentation, so that's a problem. We also use such quantitative inputs and in a large number of images, so we need this kind of uh, systems to work, we need large number of images, around 5,000 images in different OCT platforms like Visante, Cirrus, Cassia, and we kind of had almost 0.9 AUC. That is good, but still not good enough. Now comes the deep learning networks. So we talked about the convolutional neural networks. This is a sort of multi-level deep network. You can see here, this is how it works. You take the entire image, and then the image basically is pixels, converted into a binary square. It's called the layer. And such multiple layers are created from this image and they are connected within themselves, like how the neural cortex sends signals to different parts of the brain. So these layers are connected. Finally, they are simplified into smaller pools. And then finally, it comes into yes or no situation after comparing to the training data set. So this is intuitively how a, you know, a deep learning network works. This is a very simplified format. So a multi-level deep network, how it works? It takes smaller images, even smaller images, depending upon the resolution, and then it comes to the same conclusion. Sometimes even these multi-levels are also connected. So this kind of a system we worked and you can see this is a video showing how it is doing it in the real time. We are selecting an image, and subsequently, this is a serious image of a closed angle. Within few seconds, you are able to get it as closed or open. The reason why we are putting, up, putting this up here is, when you have such images, 
people go to exper experts for saying whether it is, you know, to analyze this. It can be used by general ophthalmologists also. So with this system, we were almost getting, with, it, with 10,000 to 15,000 images, we were getting almost 0.95 or 0.96 uh, accuracy. You can see that uh, this is the heat map picking up the area of interest in this deep learning network systems. This is actually an AUC for gonioscopic angle closure with the ASOCT image. This study was subsequent to this. Uh, there was another uh, group from Los Angeles which has used the same convolutional neural network in around 5,000 images. And they have also got similar results for two quadrant and three quadrant closure. So this is about the uh, angle images. And you can see that uh, this is one of the uh, softwares that uh, Singapore Eye uh, Research Institute has come up with for diabetic retinopathy, something similar to what the Google has used. They have used a different platform, and we have used what we call as a residual neural network. And we have, and we can see that the uh, referable glaucoma definition is here, and we could get almost a 0.94 uh, AUC for just saying possible glaucoma. So this can be used in a, a setting similar to like diabetic patient screening. This is another thing with the visual field patterns. As you can see here, they use the AGAS definitions and the AUC was almost 0.9. So to conclude, we have various AI systems available for angle images, fundus images, visual field patterns, somewhere between 0.9 to 0.96, which are very good accuracy. These are based on a large number of images, between 10,000 to 125,000 images. So it is up to us to combine this knowledge and adapt in clinical pra practice and use it in a proper screening opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mani, for highlighting a very important aspect of artificial intelligence for glaucoma. So I think we have run out, out of time. We'll be available outside the hall for any questions. I thank all the speakers and the audience and would like to invite General Parihar to please come and take the stage. Thank you.